Some Buddha Senior, and we're here in the Gambia having a ball. I was born in a little rural town in Georgia by the name of Dublin, Georgia, and uh, we were part of the Great Migration uh, northward. And uh, my mother and uh, myself moved up to Chicago, and predominantly, I was raised in a single-family household with my mom, and we had hard times. We always made it. And the thing that uh, I can get out of that is uh, the hustle ethic that I developed. Uh, whenever life dealt me a hard blow, I would find out a way to keep pushing past it instead of just quitting and saying, hey, it's somebody else's fault. You know, uh, I drove past it. My childhood was like, well, actually I was born in Chicago. To my parents was uh, Alfred Alfonso and Mary Vine. They both were, my father was head of the gang on the west side of Chicago. In the 60s, he was the, the, the chief of the vice lord. And my mother was a gang, the lady of the uh, vice lord. She was a, a lady vice lord. And when she got pregnant with me, I was, you know, she was in the gang and somehow my father killed someone and she got, put in prison at this time she's pregnant with me so I was actually born in the correctional Cook County Jail mm -hmm. that's where I come from and that's what you probably see a lot of I don't know if it's what you want to call it evilness but sometimes I'm very stubborn but mm -hmm. you, you'll see a lot of it mm -hmm. but that's a, a little bit about me from Chicago all right guys um Growing up as a teenager on the west side of Chicago was uh, traumatic uh, a lot of the times. Uh, I played sports, uh, football, and running track to try to get away from some of the traumatic experiences uh, I went through. Uh, again, I developed a hard work ethic because there were a lot of times in the single family household where you know, all we had to eat was like uh, ketchup sandwiches or mustard sandwiches or mayonnaise and uh, I wanted to eat a little bit more. And at this time I developed a reading habit and I read a book by uh, Dick Gregory, the late Dick Gregory, uh, called They Call Me Nigger. And he says something in the book that really kind of came home with me. To get out of his poverty environment he went to this college on a track scholarship and the only reason he did that was to have something to eat three times a day and a nice comfortable place to sleep and that really hit home with me and that kind of propelled me to my college years uh, after high school. I was a very popular uh, 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 athlete in high school and got a partial scholarship uh, to a couple of universities. That was my teenage years, guys. My teenage life was pretty rough growing up. I was a, um, my mom, she took care of me. She was a single mom because my dad was no longer around. It was, it was really rough. It was just my mom and my sister and I at home. She played cards and bingo a lot. She also was a, a nurse at night so she was never at home i was more over to my aunt's house and at this time this is where i'm in being introduced to rick at 12 years old i was very young when i was introduced with him but you know that was our childhood around the summertime i would go play over there be with him because you know i 
I didn't really have a mom or a dad because my mom was out all the time. Dad was never in my life. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I said, there were, it was very rough coming up on the west side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know anyone to really train me and show me how to be a teenager at mm -hmm. that time. And what about your high school life? My high school life was pretty much, pretty much bad because I dropped out at the age of, I think I was 15 because I got pregnant at an early age. I was 16 when I uh, got pregnant with my first child. Mm -hmm. who, who, who's the person that impregnated you? You. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Yes, we had our first child when I was, what, 17? Mm hmm And that was pretty much rough. After the, the teenage years for being with my mom, when I hooked up with my, my now husband, mm -hmm. everything was okay. All right. All right, guys, at this time, I'm in college, and I'm becoming disillusioned with college. I uh, found out a lot of harsh realities about college. Uh, just uh, encountered a lot of racism. Uh, in high school now, it was a predominantly black school, but these two universities that I went to were predominantly white schools. So it was a lot of, uh, how do you say, culture shock for me. Uh, at any rate, I dropped out after um, a year and a half of college. And at this time, I moved back to the west side of Chicago, uh, where I started before uh, staying with my mom, single family household again. And at this time, I started to experiment with drugs and alcohol and uh, noticed that I was going down the wrong path. And uh, again, like I told you, these obstacles that uh, I overcome, I decided uh, enough was enough, and so I signed up for the military and didn't tell anybody until it was time to go. That's probably like a month or two before I left. At this time, I'm pregnant and he doesn't know. Yeah, she didn't tell me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I explained to my mom, because it was getting time for me to leave. Mom, I signed up for the military. She started crying, made me start crying. But uh, it was something that I felt I had to do to turn my world around because I didn't like the downward spiral that I was headed in. Uh, we all know how that turned out in Chicago's west side. Young black male drinking, uh, experimenting with uh, drugs, so we know how that ends. Uh, at this time, I joined the military and uh, finished basic training, and I get a phone call from my now wife, says that she's pregnant. And, uh, and he I, says, is it mine? <laughs> of typical, course. Typical, yours. Yeah, typical guy response. I apologize, family. But uh, anyway, uh, she said it was mine, and I accepted the responsibility. And after uh, um, the technical portion of military training called AIT, I went to Chicago uh, to visit uh, my daughter, my wife, and family because all the training was done. I'm and, about four, maybe five months pregnant at this time. Mm -hmm. Yep. And... Most of the military uh, time was spent overseas, away from my family, but we did have a chance to get together and um, uh, develop our relationship uh, to what it is now. You know, married almost uh, uh, 30 years now. Yeah, it'll be 28 next month. Almost yes. 30, yeah, good yes. job. Just like you just got married yesterday. Okay. And you know, uh, having a kid while he's in the military, it wasn't so hard. It actually taught me, it made me grow up more. You know, I became more of a woman then. And how many kids did you have while you, um, he was in the military? We, when he was in the military, we had, all together we had five, mm -hmm. you know, throughout the military life. And how was that, like raising him while he was away? When he would go away for like maybe a year, mm -hmm. it was kind of hard, but then, you know, I just, I just dealt with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, taught the kids that this is their responsibility when, you know, the older kids. Yes, and that's very strong of you. Yes, and they helped a lot, and you know, we got through it all together. Other yes. than that, you know, we made it. Yes, and you did a good job raising them. Yes, I agree. Yes, we did. All right, guys, I forgot to mention now, uh, during the time that I had joined the military, I experienced a war uh, called Desert Shield, Desert Storm. That's where the American troops got deployed uh, overseas for 
whatever that reason was. Uh, anyway, uh, at this time I came across a book that changed my life. Like I said, I like reading books. And I read a book called The Autobiography of Malcolm X by Alex Haley. Uh, once I read that book, I changed my religion, I changed my name, and a couple mm -hmm. of years after that, geographical location. Go ahead, sweetie. Yes, we stopped celebrating Christmas. Christmas. Mm -hmm. Actually, that the time when he read that book, he called me up and said, Babe, I know uh, what we're going to celebrate now. It's called Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. And from ever since then, that's when we start celebrating Kwanzaa. When well, I left the war. When he left Operation Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. Yeah, just called me because the war ended of uh, August of 91. Yeah, it didn't last 91. long at all. Uh -huh. And he came home, I believe it was March 91. Right, yeah. yeah. And, and something else happened now. Like I got, like I became disillusioned with the college, experiencing the front hand racism. I'm starting to experience this in the military. Uh, I kept wanting promotions because in my mind, the higher promotion, the more money you make. The more money you make, the more you can support your family. And so that right there sort of rubs some people wrong why does this guy keep wanting promotions like that, you know? Mm -hmm. More authority, more power. So, you know, I made a lot of enemies in the Army, but that's their problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what year did you guys get married? We got married right after he came back from the, um, the war. war. Mm -hmm. We actually got married in 1991 of, right. of October. That's right. Yes. Okay. And at this time, I'm pregnant with my second child. Second child. <laughs> <laughs> me a little bit about your middle age life. Wow, I would have to say our uh, middle age years was probably the most traumatic things I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, once we left the military, you know, we tried some things. I've always wanted to be my own boss. And uh, when I was in the military, I kept accumulating these credentials, uh, associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a certified professional manager, trying to uh, put this top-notch resume together that would get me hired in order to provide for my family. And uh, when I got out of the military in 1998, I found out that those credentials were basically worthless. I had people with ninth grade educations that were my supervisors telling me my education didn't matter. They didn't have it, of course they would say that. But, uh, like I said before, time and time again, when obstacles came our way, we found a way to get around it. So we developed this cleaning business. We started for like $35. Well, first, once you got, we were actually in Amway. Right, right. We I forgot about a, that. A networking market. Yeah, yeah. Tell and again, I was, if for those who wanted to know, I didn't go to college. Actually, I did go to college one semester. So mm -hmm. I became a stay-at-home mom. He didn't want me to work. I mean, he, he said if I wanted to work, I can work, but he'd rather me be at home. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was, a stay-at-home mom. But a stay-at-home mom don't mean that I was sitting around. That's we right. actually started a business. That's right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that business was? Usa Buddha Enterprises. It, exactly. Mm -hmm. Usa Buddha Enterprises with the Amway uh, Corporation. Business development. And how right. did that go? It, it went well, but the money wasn't there. Exactly. And you had to try to basically find needles in haystacks to recruit. And you were spending more than what you were exactly, making. Exactly, exactly. But we got a lot of experience from that. Okay. Yes, we mm -hmm. did. After that, we started our RC cleaning service. After that, he, you know, left the military. Right. He left the military in '98. '98. Yeah. And and that was the business that I was referring to earlier. We started for uh, thirty-five dollars. And the gross that business made in any one month, excuse me, the most it made in any one month was $16,000. Not bad. One for, month. One month. One month. Yeah. Not bad for a business that you start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And by the way, guys, we're in the Gambia now. Most of that equipment is over here, so the business now becomes international. RMC was a cleaning service. We cleaned uh, commercial hoods, $4,000 in one night. Apartments. Apartments, between, hotels. Restaurants. Yes. Yeah. Very, very lucrative, very lucrative. Whatever it was that you want clean, we cleaned it. That was it, that was it. Mm -hmm. And how was it um, juggling work life and like the kids, putting them in school and all that? How was that? Well, I, I, I felt the finances were there to do that, mm -hmm. but everything else, it wasn't there. At this time, I'm sorry, guys, I'm sorry. We experienced so many bankruptcy, like, pow, <laughs> you know? 
And, uh, you know, we had to fight that out. Actually, the first bankruptcy was with our sixth child. Yeah, yeah. So I was pregnant with my sixth child yeah. with our first bankruptcy. Yeah, we filed more bankruptcies than preg- we had children. Yes, I was actually went into court pregnant mm-hmm. with her, yep. getting ready to have her. Right. That was we me. succeeded with that. Mm-hmm. After that, <laughs> <laughs> we got discharged out of that yeah, bankruptcy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then I come back. She's in the chair. Mm-hmm. He wants to know why we are discharged right. from being in the bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. Now, now that business, guys, that business grossed anywhere from sixty to eighty-five thousand dollars annually, yeah. with the most being in one year. I can't recall right. where it was Seven. six digits. Yeah, six digits, like yeah. one hundred seven thousand in one year. One hundred seven thousand in one year. But it was fluctuating up and down and up and down. And again, like the military, uh, the more success we found. The more enemies we created. Yeah, well, I like to say this: when we were in the business with the RNC, we started having a challenge with our oldest child. We had challenge with her, and that was kind of like a lot of stalling with the business right. too with her. Mm-hmm. And then you know another we, obstacle. Or another challenge. obstacle, but yeah, mm-hmm. we have we had our challenges too. And then, guys, uh, what we've done was try to share with you briefly our 50 years of residing in America because now we're currently residing in Africa, West Africa or the Gambia, like I've said. And so personally, I feel we're doing our closing remarks right now. Personally, I feel the the events that happen in our life happen for a reason, to make us stronger, tough skin, and to make that transition to something better in in life. Because in America, we experienced a lot of racism, uh, a lot of times I got fired. I mean, man, we were about... A lot we, of bankruptcies. A lot of bank. We said that, yeah. <laughs> um, we was, um, we, we just had to keep hitting the reset button. Every time we would build a substantial income, racism would come in, and we have to hit that reset button, hit that reset button, hit that reset button. And the children didn't know anything. Didn't know anything. And so finally, we kind of got tired of hitting that reset button, and we were supposed to move, I'm, I'm jumping back a little bit, we were supposed to move to East Africa in 1991 after the war, but they threw me another promotion. It wants to and, be a platoon sergeant. Yeah, yeah, so they mm-hmm. babied me in for staying a little bit longer, but, but at any rate, uh, 2015, uh, this will be the next video, we took a visit over here to the uh, Gambia, we fell in love with it, went back six months, packed up everything that we could and got the hell out of there. And now we're here. How did your relatives, siblings, and all of them <laughs> feel about your moves to Africa? Wow. Wow. Do you want to cover that first or me? Uh, they was angry. Everyone was angry yes. with us. Even yes. my children were angry yes. with us. Wow. My son said why we didn't come when he was just a little kid. He was very <laughs> angry. My other, my oldest daughter saying we're moving too far. My mother-in-law said that when, when people move far away like that, people die. Wow. I mean, if we stay, people still gonna die. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. We had to do what was right for us. Right. Mm-hmm. And that was right for us. Right. And my mom, personally, she was very, very upset that I was leaving. And uh, right now, I kind of tell them, we've been in the Gambia for about three years. We've accomplished more in three short years in the Gambia than we did all 50 years in America. And we're free. And we're free. And we're free. No more stress. Mm-hmm. No more sleepless nights. That's right. We are free. And on that note, guys, we'd like for you to hit the like button and subscribe. Look for our next video. Yeah, our next video is going to be a lot more uh, situations that we've encountered and things that you need to know in case you want to make that likewise journey and stuff so it's for me about our visit when we came first came to visit in uh 2015 2015 so for now guys love, love peace and souls, and souls.